All right, I am back with another video, and this time I am doing a little Q and A session here. Uh, I have not done one of these in an extremely long time, uh, so I figured it might be time to circle back around, as there is not really anything urgent in the news that I'm seeing, and I don't know if people want me to uh, keep talking about my adventures with Cyberpunk uh, again, but um, I figured I would uh, just take some questions from the audience here. I had this open for like, I don't know, 15 minutes, and there's already more questions than I can answer. I apologize if I don't get to your question. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to do them all, but I will try and get through as many as I can. And I'll try to remember everyone's names, even though they're weird Twitter names a lot of the time. Uh, <laughs> All right, so just going in order as the, uh, they appear under my initial question here. We have Alto asking, what were your favorite games before Destiny and do any still stick out as memorable favorites? Um, yeah, there's a, a lot of games I, I loved before Destiny. It wasn't always just you know me maining Destiny and, and nothing else because there was, of course, a time before Destiny uh, in pre, what, pre-2014 when the original game came out. Um, some of my games are most played games of all time. Diablo 2, Diablo 3, I play just an absurd amount of, uh, to the point of almost worrisome addiction in some cases. Um, really love that series, and I, uh, am certainly looking forward to Diablo 4, despite all Blizzard's nonsense. Um, I sunk a ton of time into Halo 3 multiplayer. That was my most played game probably across college. Uh, my buddies and I played local split screen on that all the time and we had a great time doing that i did play a good amount of uh halo 2 local multiplayer with my like real life friends where we would just play against each other uh we would also play smash 64 that was one thing where my friends would come over we would just play that forever uh in terms of like i have a pretty long list of of narrative single player games that i really have loved over the years um, the whole mass effect series that's really something that has resonated with me and inspired a lot of pretty much inspired my first book trilogy uh, with my love for Mass Effect to a certain extent. Um, God of War, the, the new God of War was my game of the generation, last generation. I really loved it. I love the Last of Us series, The Witcher 3, um, Elden Ring is certainly up there now. Uh, the, the, sorry, you were saying before Destiny, so not all of these were before Destiny, but that is um, a, good, a good smattering, I suppose, of uh, games that are on the, the list there. Uh, Mr. Woodhouse, what's up, Woodhouse? What's the one live service game that isn't a looter that you wish did better? That isn't a looter? Isn't a looter? What? Okay. Um, oh, man. All the ones, like, like, the ones that immediately come to mind are, like, Anthem, but that's a looter. Uh, honestly, Halo Infinite? Like, I, I'm really down on Halo Infinite a lot, but I had a vision of, like, what a live service Halo game could be where you had, like, a, a robust multiplayer component, but you also had this, like... Here's the campaign, here's this map that's going to expand and grow over time. There's going to be, you know, new missions that come up for Chief and Cortana, and the story will develop and evolve as time goes on. And like as we know, none of that has happened. There's been uh, no developments like that. That wouldn't have that I'm not asking for like, you know, grinding out loot as Master Chief or something in an open world, but I thought this would be kind of a different way to tell Master Chief's kind of an unfolding story for him over time, and that has just not happened in addition to all the problems in multiplayer. So that one uh, has really bummed me out, and like I used to be a huge fan of Halo. I have not been a huge fan in the 343 years, and that is only kind of decreasing even more over time, but I genuinely wish that was like kind of the, the vision I had of a, uh, a live service Halo game, which I do think could lend itself to the model, just it's clearly not doing it correctly now. Um, all right, sorry, if you're both asking like multiple questions, I might only be able to do one of them. Uh, Hobo Spooky asks, when you write your articles, do you tend to start with a more structured outline at first or just write stream of consciousness style and touch it up after? 100% stream of consciousness style. <laughs> um, you may notice how fast I write and how much, how, how quickly I can crank articles out of there. I would not be able to do this without stream of consciousness. Like the, the exception is, if I'm doing something really long, like a structured review or something, I might be like, okay, I want to get to this point, this point, and this point for the review, but I don't do like a ton of that. So most of the stuff I'm writing is like really kind of quick news articles. So I just write it and then I read it over like four or five times to make sure I have a minimal amount of typos, even though I miss them. Um, and then I, you know, double check everything I need to double check and it is out there. And that is how I turn around stories very quickly. Um, 
And some of these, you know, there a lot of them are pretty short, so you don't really need to outline a 450, 500 word story. That's just kind of like, what's the news? What's your take on the news? That's it. So that's kind of my my writing process for most of the stuff that I, I put out. Um, Kuma Kobe asked the top three games you want to cover that are still coming out this year. Uh, okay, that's a good question. Um, the Gotham Knights. I have like a bad feeling about it but i love batman and i really want that game to be good so i certainly uh, am going to check it out um i did not play the modern warfare beta but i am curious to get into that at least a little bit around launch uh because it seems like it could be a return to form from what i'm hearing from a lot of people and i have not played a call of duty game in like two years so i'm kind of missing it a little bit um and then of course god of war ragnarok that one's obvious uh, that is, you know, easily one of my most anticipated games of the year, and uh, I'm certainly looking forward to um, playing that, and then have everyone yell at me for spoilers for the most, like, innocuous things I say about it. Uh, <laughs> Elijah asks, realistically, when do you think we're going to get a Destiny TV show, and do you think it is going to be live action or animated? Um, when? I'm going to say, I'm going to say within the next two years. Uh, I think they'll announce it. Um maybe by Lightfall, maybe around Lightfall, and then these things tend to get announced pretty well ahead of time, and animation takes a good amount of time. Um, sorry, to answer the next part of the question, I think it's going to be animated. Uh, I think Bungie is smart enough to have realized, you know, all these different, very disparate games that have done really well with anime adaptations and live action adaptations are much riskier, much more expensive. Um, so I think the, the correct move here would be to start with uh, an animated series. I don't know who they'll partner with for that, uh, but um, this isn't to say they can't do live action later, and I, I bet they probably would like to someday, but um, the type of game Destiny is, it's like, it's so much action, it's so much space magic. Like, I get why you're not going to make, you know, The Last of Us adaptation in anime. That would be kind of cool, but <laughs> like, that is more, that is, you know, more logical to translate into live action initially than I think Destiny would be uh, so I, I think they're going to have a wide range of projects, but I would bet a lot of money that they're going to start with animation, and we'll see that sometime probably within the next two years here. Um, Cash asks, if you could make a game, what would its setting be? Plot, characters. Uh, oh, man. I don't know if I can come up with a whole plot and characters on the fly. Um, just the genre, I think it would be a single RPG, a single player RPG with a lot of loot, open worlds, Hopefully, I, I don't know, like Elden Ring has been one of my favorite games in that genre in an extremely long time, just because of, you know, how uh, much it relied on you kind of exploring and finding all these mysteries and like, you know, uh, assembling your build and things like that. And I just, I don't know, I, I probably like sci-fi genre, that is normally where I, I lay my head in terms of like inventing things. But, you know, for as much as I play games, I don't like, I don't actively have like a... a list of game ideas like in my you know drafts or something like i have you know some uh i have all my books and i have like i don't know five other books in my mind and you know i have ideas about making them movies and, and or tv shows or something but i don't actually have like this if i can make a game this is my game and i have it all mapped out and stuff so that's one thing that has kind of eluded me over the years even though i primarily cover games Game making games is very hard <laughs> um Trey Coleman asks, why is there not a simple Legend Master Lost Sector playlist? Seems like a playlist would be much easier than clicking through all the planets, looking for the icon, flying down, having to load back into the world, only to start another run. Uh, that's not a bad idea, actually. A playlist for Lost Sectors. I kind of like that idea. I, I think I think the problem is it was probably be from a technical perspective because Lost Sectors are instances that are linked to the entire larger world. And so, like, there might be some trouble trying to, you know, draw up something like that. Granted, strikes are kind of like that, too. And strikes are tied to the larger map as well. So maybe there is a way to do that. Um, I do think the current system of just, like, checking around the map to find what it is is kind of weird. And I don't love that. I would... Um, this is where D2 Lost Sector Bot will yell at me for not plugging them. So uh, that is the best way is to follow that account. I do like the idea of like, what if it wasn't, you know, what, what it is now? What if it was randomized? What if you could farm uh, a daily exotic or, or just farm exotics in general through some sort of lost sector 
playlist. That's actually, that's a very good idea. I, again, I don't know how technically feasible that is, but I think it is a, a fundamentally good idea. Um, the other problem would be like, if you have it in the playlist, there's you so many different champions and shield modifiers and stuff that come up where you would have to adjust each time. So I don't know. There's a lot of problems with the idea, but fundamentally, I kind of like the concept if there was some way to make it work. Um... Gumdrop Studios asks, what's the scariest, most challenging thing about writing articles? Like, you ever get that hurdle and think, oh god, not this. Um, also, does burnout ever impact writing? Like, Marvel, Destiny, Burnout, etc. Uh, yeah, I've talked a little bit about Destiny, Burnout lately, where try it, like it's not just that I have a daily column about Destiny now, it's that I also make a daily video about Destiny 2, and that can be a bit much sometimes during uh, an era where there is not a ton happening, and so you have to kind of really reach... Uh, for topics today, I'm doing a Q&A because I genuinely cannot think of, you know, a Destiny topic I really wanted to talk about. So that can definitely happen. Um, challenging thing about writing articles. What, one thing is like if you put a lot of work into something and then that thing just underperforms terribly and nobody views. This is not unique to me or even unique to writing. Uh, it, has, it happens with content creators a lot too, like videos. Um, that is very dispiriting. Uh, it's <laughs> For me, it's kind of a well-known um, fact that like if you spend all this time and do some like elaborate interview with someone that is going to get 5% of the views that like your quick news article about whatever uh, gets. But like you ideally want to be doing both. It's just, it can be exhausting, you know, the more work you put into something and then the less result you see from that. Um, Coram Blash Hall. Sorry, that's not right. Blashki. Uh, so everyone's got a big desire for endgame matchmaking content. What if instead of six man, it's eight man, leaving room for errors and mess ups because two extra people are present? Love your content. I hope you and the family are well. Thank you. Um, I, I mean, I'm not. I'm certainly not opposed to like more players. You know, in increasing the max player count for activities. I assume that this is not a thing they do because of like technical constraints, and then you can't just like jam two more players into, you know, an existing six man activity and have it still be balanced because everything is going to be balanced for six man. Um, I do think it would, it would certainly be fun for there to be some sort of, you know, eight player activity. I'm, that reminds me of like escalation protocol back when you were trying to get like a full group of people on the map doing that. Like I would love an activity like that. I think that would be fun. Um, it's just that I, have not seen them even kind of really inch in that direction other than when we accidentally had 12 man raids at one time, which was very fun, you know, admittedly, but not balanced. I'm getting spam texts. Great. Um, the U S postal service says my delivery address isn't valid. I better send them my credit card information. Oh, okay. Plague asks, what's your favorite book and how is the progress on your total, totally secret, not known at all book? I don't know if I have just one favorite book. Every time I like get asked this question though, the one book that really jumps out to me is World War Z. I love World War Z. I don't know what it is about that book, but it is so freaking fantastic the way both they like the way they bring the zombie world to life and how they break it up into these different viewpoints of how it affects, you know, all these different parts of the world. And like obviously they made a very not great movie about it and stuff, but World War Z, I, I just absolutely love that book. I love The Road by Cormac McCarthy. That also was a very heavy influence uh, on my uh, original trilogy. I love the Expanse series. Um, that is uh, one of my highest highest honors is that James S.A. Corey follows me on Twitter, who is, it's two guys who are one author, but uh, I'm, I'm very proud of that. Um, I should I should make like a book, a book tier list at some point, because there, I mean, there's a ton. It's just, yeah. Um, oh, progress on my totally not secret. Okay, so this really slowed down, <laughs> as you might expect when I had a kid. Uh, so there's not a ton of extra time for writing. I am trying to still work on it. I am 12 chapters in, and my books are usually like 40 chapters. So I'm getting there, but we'll see. And this is not a sequel to anything I've written already. It is something new, and it's probably going to be something that is self-contained, not like the start of a new series. Phil asks, have you ever gotten the chance to give... Bungie developers direct feedback. If so, what elements of the game did you get a chance to talk about together? Hope all your new dad stuff lately has been going well. Thank you. Um, I only went to Bungie once. I went for the House of Wolves reveal events. And uh, as part of like, I there was like a, a streamer group and a press group. I was in the press group. And I met Deej. And like I met a bunch of other people who I probably know now but didn't know back then. I didn't even know who Deej was back then. 
uh, he was the first person who introduced himself to me. And like you, you give a little bit of feedback when you're at stuff like that, but it, that wasn't like a creator summit. That was like, here's the thing we made, you know, you get an early look at it. Um, so that wasn't like a feedback gathering session. That said, I am in the privileged position of, I know many, many, many people who work at Bungie read my articles, uh, whether they agree with them or not, or like them is another story, but um, I a lot of people from Bungie follow me. I mean, I have a daily Destiny column. I am giving, you know, I'd say 70 to 80% of my articles or some sort of feedback in some form or another. Like, I have seen many things change over time that I have suggested. I cannot say I can, I can't point to one thing and be like, yes, I did that. That is some a change I made, but I it, it could have happened. So like, there's, there's almost too many examples because I've talked about so many things over the years uh, that, um, you know, some of them have come true. And well, I know they read my articles. I, I don't know how much quote influence I have over them, probably almost none. <laughs> and they're gonna, you know, they're gonna do what they do and they take, um, you know, they have their own very elaborate decision-making process within the studio. And then they take larger, you know, surveys of the, the player base to see what everyone, like, I don't, I feel like very infrequently are you ever going to see them point to like one creator or one idea and be like, yes, that. Maybe sometimes, but if, you, if, if they do, there's not really a way to verify that. Um, all right. Pint full of tokens asks, are you still a fan of drip feed content, i.e. the Destiny 2 seasonal story model? If not, what changes would you like to implement into the seasonal content going forward. Um, this, I almost made a whole video about the problem. Of st- I, I still might do this, but like the problem with seasonal storytelling is like Bungie is doing it about as good as you can do it. Like obviously they've had a, a significant number of narrative improvements. There's like multiple, multiple people having voice work in a season. There's lots of lore, there's cutscenes. there's dialogue things. But like when you add it all up, it's still like five minutes a week, 10 minutes a week of like actual new story development and it's just it's so hard for that to feel like enough and over the grand course of the season it's like four hours of total seasonal content and probably three of those hours is like the catch crash you have to run before you get to the story or the 50 champions you have to kill before you get to the story so but conversely like is this still better than the alternative where the alternative is okay you get the whole story front loaded in you know week one and you can you can get the whole saga, just play it whenever you want. I don't know if that's better for a live game. It feels like it's not going to be, and as irritating as the time gate stuff is, would we not be more irritated with finishing the story in 48 hours and then having nothing to do but grind playlists or whatever for the next three months? So it's it's a very tough situation that I don't really know the answer to. And I know Budgie is working very hard on the narrative side and like Game narrative stuff is, is something I'm very interested in. And they had that really good article the other day about, um, you know, the narrative process and stuff. But um, it is it is hard to tell a story like a TV show when you're a game, given all the considerations that you need and the very limited amount of total time you're going to end up having to convey that story. So, yeah, it's it's hard. I'll probably go into that in a, in a different video. But um, what games are you looking forward to the next year? Yeah, there's a, uh, this is from Storm Stormmaster. Um, there's a few questions like this. Uh, Starfield is probably my primary one. Um, not saying that as an Xbox fanboy, just saying that as someone who is very interested in Bethesda's next giant game. It is a very important game and is certainly going to be um, a make or break. I know I'm not going to say that. <laughs> it's not make or break, but it's a big deal for Xbox because it's going to be its you know first major flagship acquisition game of that scale. And uh, it will really kind of dictate the next few years of like how how people feel the current era but that's this going and and if they are able to kind of invent truly new things uh it's sci-fi so that's you know hooked me right off the bat i'm like not wild about the aesthetic that i've seen from it so far but i don't know i'm not gonna i'm not gonna lean too much into that if it happens if if it really happens and diablo 4 comes out in uh 2023 which i still have a hard time believing that is easily my most anticipated game of next year as much as Blizzard is just crapping the bed lately and all this stupid crap that's happening with them, Diablo 4 looks really good. I have never seen anything out of Diablo 4 that does not look really fantastic and like it's going to be exactly what I'm looking for. Uh, I am almost scared of it because of how much time I could see myself putting into it. 
but I will see. I mean, it is hard to trust Blizzard at this point, like given their, I don't know, the last five to seven years, um, both in terms of game quality and as like as a company. Uh, we will see how that changes under Activision, or sorry, under Microsoft. I think that deal is going through. Jim Ryan can say whatever he wants. That deal is going through. This is America. Companies buy each other all the time. It's not, no one's going to stop it, really. So uh, we'll see. Those are the two that come to mind immediately. Um, Gaz asks, how would you fix the ritual playlist in Destiny? No restrictions on development time, cost. What would you do to revamp the playlist? So I... That was my whole article today. <laughs> I wrote a whole playlist article today. So I'm not, I won't rehab, recap all that. I, the caveat here is no restrictions on development time cost. Okay, if you give me no restrictions, you know, I'm going to dump a dozen new strikes, crucible maps and gamut maps into the mix because I, I mean, I think that is primarily the thing it's missing. I mean, we had one truly new crucible map in years and it's not very good. We've had negative two gambit maps. Um, Strikes, they've added some back that they sunset, but we've still lost a lot from sunsetting. Uh, I love that they put the battlegrounds in that playlist. I think that was a great idea. I would also put more stuff in there. I would put Empire Hunts. I would put some of the longer Nightmare things. Uh, so that's just go read go read the article. It's on my page. You'll see it. Um, uh, Travis, as the kind of funny for Pop Culture Gaming Podcast, what are your go to gaming media podcasts? So. I really only, like, I kind of only listen to, like, news podcasts. Like, I listen to The Daily with The New York Times, which is, like, very basic, just to, like, figure out what is going on in the actual world. Uh, for gaming, though, I, I kind of just mostly stick with Destiny stuff. I, I you know, um, uh, I try to listen to, like, Firing Range and uh, DCP and, and things like that and uh, The Last Word. So I'm, I usually stick with, I used to listen to, um, I think it's Triple Click. It's, uh, it's Jason Schreier and them. Their podcast is good. I used to listen to the Waypoint podcast a good amount with Patrick. Uh, so there's a, there's a few in there, but um, I've I've fallen a little bit behind in my my gaming podcast consumption lately. Um, Connor asks, let's say Destiny gets an Edge Runners self-contained original animated story in the universe. What's your dream cast? What lore game characters would you like to see make cameos? Oh man, that's probably a whole article. I don't know if I can do that off the top of my head here. Uh, Whatever they do, they got to have Lance as Zavala, like, anchoring it. I mean, granted, maybe not, depending on if they... One of the ideas is, like, if you made a Destiny anime, you you probably wouldn't adapt anything we've played. I, I don't think there's going to be, like, a player guardian as the star of Destiny. I, I think you're going to pick a story from Destiny, probably something in the past, probably the Twilight Gap or Dredge and Yor and Shin Malfur and all that stuff. Like, you're probably going to do one of those. Uh, so in that case, like... I don't know. I can't think of a, a cast off the top of my head, but my guess is it would be kind of a self-contained story like that. And I think that's probably a good idea for a, kind of a first outing here. And then maybe we move into, you know, present day and, and more established characters over time with future seasons, different shows, stuff like that. So I guess, yeah, we'll see. Um, Ulto asks, over the past two years, do you feel like you've become more of a destiny celebrity personality than just a games and entertainment journalist. Your opinions feel much more influential in both the destiny world and gaming as a whole than a few years ago. Thank you. I maybe, I don't know. Like I, I don't really understand my, my growth per se over the past few years. Like it was, it was pretty steady for a while, but like, I, I don't know. I just got a lot of Twitter followers. I don't really know why. Like I tweet a lot. I make a lot of memes. I, I I don't know. Like, I, I think, you know, I spend a good amount of time on Twitter, like, cultivating that presence. So I think that has led to, quote, influ in, like, increased reach. My actual writing, I mean, I have the platform of Forbes, which allows me um, to, you know, place articles in your Google feed that might not be there otherwise. And I get several billion, you know, views, views a month. So I know that many people are reading my articles or at least clicking on them. Um, I... I do think I have become more of a destiny centric person, certainly over the last few years, like the more I have embraced the game, I am talking, I'm writing about it every day, almost making videos about it every day, certainly tweeting about it every day to some extent, probably more than most full-time destiny creators, uh, to a certain, like granted those people are, are streaming destiny for, you know, 10 hours a day and I'm not doing that. Um, we're making much more elaborate YouTube videos than I do. Uh, but I, I do, feel like I'm part of that community now. And I, I really do feel embraced by them. I 
have very, very rarely had bad experiences with anyone in the creator community. They've all been very friendly outside of one notable exception, which you may remember. But uh, besides that, like everyone who seems really cool on stream has been really cool to me in public and in private. Uh, a lot of them have given me uh, advice on on things. Special shout out to Fallout. Fallout's all these uh, helping me out with advice. Uh, Rick, Mtash, they've been a, they've been great resources for helping me out as I move to more more video kind of stuff. Uh, and it's it really I know there's a lot of like everyone's like oh the Destiny community is the worst and like uh, I can't like maybe and I can see aspects of that and you know we're not talking about like PvP debates here but there are a lot of really cool folks uh, in that scene and I really enjoy uh, hanging out with them. Um, Sam Pat asks, how has having a kid changed your perspective on the world? Has it changed anything about the way you view video games? Oh man, getting into the deep, deep questions now. Um, yeah, yeah, I, it's, everyone's right when it says it, it totally changes your perspective on the world. And I don't know, for me, it was just, it's, it's such an, uh, a new responsibility where you just know, like, no matter what happens, like, you know, I always used to always fret about what if I lost my job or like, what if this happened or what I like, but like now you don't like, you just know you're going to make it work. Cause like you have to, cause like you have a child, you have to provide for them. And like, you will just soldier on and, and get it done kind of no matter what uh, you have to do. And you are working towards something very specific now. Like you're, you know, wanting to have a family is no longer just a nebulous concept. You are working because you literally have a family <laughs> uh, who needs both, you know, financial resources, but they also need your time. And so that is a, a balance you have to work out as you may see or have heard. Like I have Noah in, in daycare because my wife and I both work. And even though I work from home, it is not very easy to watch uh, a, you know, an infant um, while you are working from home, which I did for, you know, his first two months. But um, that's something that we needed for our family. So uh, it, it is absolutely thrilling every day you know he's doing something new and just you know a joy to be around and like people always say like oh you know having a dog will like make you so much happier and like that's solely true and evie is a good example of that but uh having a kid and raising a kid is like that times like kind of a hundred <laughs> um how has it changed my view on video games i think we're st like we're still too young to really think about like, oh, what's Noah's first video game going to be? And like, he's hypnotized when I'm playing a game or something and he's nearby, which I have to be careful of because I don't want him just like staring at a game for, you know, endless periods of time. So I try not to really uh, play when, he, when he's around that much. And I try to just hang out with him. Um, but that is that is a question that I, I struggle with because like I do this for a living, which is great. But like then if you have a kid who's going to obviously probably be really into video games, like how do you manage that? Like, how do I separate my work gameplay from fun gameplay and then gameplay for, with him and like be an example for him, even though I have to play stuff all the time. These are all questions I have not had the answers to yet, uh, but I am trying to kind of work those out in my own head. Uh, Nathan asks, I'll probably do a couple more here. I probably shouldn't go much over 30 minutes. I, who knows who even stuck around this long? No idea. Uh, Nathan asks, if Destiny weren't your main game to cover, what game would you prefer? If you weren't a journalist, what career path most intrigues you? Uh, if I could do anything, I would love to be an author full time. Uh, if that, you know, I fully never expect that to happen because, you know, if my books were going to be super smash hits, they probably would have been by now. Uh, and that is a ridiculously hard journey that few people ever can fully go down. Um, but I, I like writing that much and I, I, I like being creative. So I would like to do something in the creative field where, if it's not being an author, you know, movies, TV, um, video games, something like that, uh, that would be something else I would do. If, was, if Destiny was my main game to cover, uh, what I'm learning is I probably should have covered Minecraft because then I could be like some sort of famous uh, kid doing face reveals for, you know, 1.2 million people on stream and probably making, you know, 500 grand uh, just from that. But uh, no, seriously, um, that's a good question. I'm trying to think of what other games would even be so st like there's so many games that like I would love to get into Final Fantasy 14. I've heard it's awesome. I've heard people really like it. I've heard it's a great live game to keep up with. No, no possible way can I ever keep up with uh, with that at all. Like there's there's no way I could have the time to devote to another game of that scale. Like I run into this problem a few times. Like New World, Lost Ark, 
um, you know, many different live games. Even even Genshin Impact, I'm still I'm I was doing that for a while. I was doing Genshin and Destiny as my two main things, and like it's too much too too much live stuff. I can't can't do it all. So um, there there are certain other ones I'd like to pursue, but I am running into uh, some hard hard time limits. Um, <laughs> all right, this is a good this is a good last question. Regular person asks, how much a year do you spend on silver? <laughs> okay. Um, that's, I'm trying to do the math in my head here. It's, you know, probably less than I used to. So things I stopped buying, I don't really ever buy uh, ships, sparrows, emotes anymore. Um, I have my favorites that I bought a long time ago or that I've earned from certain activities. So I will just use those. However, I own every single armor set, armor ornament set in the game, except I skipped, I think it was, I skipped the revelry set because it was so ugly. I was, this was before transmog existed. So I was like, I'm not going to buy this. Like why? I don't, I don't care. Uh, I don't need this to make, make this one of my limited ornament options. So I skipped the revelry set, but like, it's like 45 bucks a season to buy all the armor. Granted, sometimes no, it's it's more than that because you have a seasonal event too. So it's like, so it's it's forty five bucks for three characters for one set, and then forty five bucks for the holiday event. So even if I'm just buying armor, uh, and then I have bought, you know, I'll buy the ex an exotic ornament or two for a weapon or a gun or whatever. Those are the things I'm still buying. Never bought transmog. No need to just do the bounties. It's not that hard, and um, so I. Hmm. I don't know. Definitely 500 bucks at least, I would say, per year. Granted, again, I don't know how much of this is bright dust, so maybe it's more like 3 400, but the amount of armor ornaments I need to pick up. This isn't this isn't even counting like just keeping up with the game. But no, I I to be fair, I do get codes from Bungie for the game itself. So like I have a Lightfall code for the whole year. I got a Witch Queen code, so I'm not I'm not paying for the game content. So I am paying for all my silver. I think but Bungie's gives me silver occasionally. Like I got, they gave me a thousand silver to buy the the new event pass that costs a thousand silver that like you, where you unlock stuff for it for the last thing. Didn't buy that. I think I used it for a different exotic ornament because there's nothing good in that bundle. I'm not going to buy it. I'm not going to spend it on that. Uh, but anyway, have I spent thousands of dollars on Destiny over the past seven years or whatever it's been? Absolutely. Have I made many, many, many thousands of dollars based on my Destiny coverage alone? Yes. So I think I am still coming out ahead in my specific circumstance. I do think Destiny is over monetized in many ways with the way it breaks up content and the amount of stuff it sells and the pricing. But there we are. Uh, so anyway, that is my uh, Q&A for today. I, I, that was probably like half the questions, not even. I need to delete this thread now or else it's going to be, uh, it's going to get out of control. Um, and I'm sorry if I didn't get to your question. I just, I, I don't think these videos should be like an hour. I don't know. Maybe they could be, but you can let me know if you all made it all the way here and you wish there was another 45 minutes of this, uh, which seems unlikely. But uh, anyway, thank you all for watching. And just not, not just today, but like every day and uh, allowing me to keep doing this. Um, there have been some really positive changes with my job lately, which uh, I, I won't go into, but they are very good. And they are because of you guys being loyal readers. So I very much uh, appreciate that. So anyway, yeah, thanks for watching and I will talk to you soon.